So uh, we already talked about chapter one and chapter two. We are done with these. So let's go through this. All right, we are done with all of that. Okay, so today we'll talk about chapter three and four. Uh, three is the properties of the dental materials, and four will be about the safety. Of the dental materials. I'll try to do this. A little bit. Okay. And again, um, you know, for the properties is what we're trying to understand. As we talked before, um, dental materials are super important for our work. The properties and the qualities of the materials would help us make either a good or maybe a bad job, right? Uh, it, it can define or um, it can help with the success or failure. You'll see we have some definitions that we need to go through and get to know. And then about safety and how we handle these uh, materials in a safe way and how we can we uh, protect ourselves and our patients from the materials that some of them can be irritant. Uh, some of them cover for the exam, which will be chapter 16. So exam one will be chapter one, two, three, four, and chapter 16. So most probably. Technically, chemical bonds are always stronger than the physical uh, bonds. And I think we talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, it you bond chemically. It's like a glue thing. You know, when you glue something to something in a way, when, uh, a reaction of two materials, that's when we have a chemical bond. Chemically, it is more strong. <clears throat> the second type of bonds are the physical, so they are weaker. But uh, both of these types of bonds, we use them in our dental materials. Remember, we did talk about that a little bit. So like amalgam filling kind of bonds mechanically to the tooth, which means physically, right? Uh, we have to prepare the tooth in a certain way so that the, the amalgam would not come out of it. Uh, while the composite instrument uh, materials are filling they have some part of it as a chemical uh, bonding to the tooth we have three states of matter solid liquid and gas definitely okay now we're going to talk about these definitions and what i did is i gave you some uh the words there so try to figure out so what do you think a measure of the weight uh of the weight of the material of the weight a material has compared to its volume density, right? So you either can copy and paste there or just type it down. Blank is the resistant of a solid uh, to penetration. Hardness. 
And then blank is the measure of material to recover its shape completely after deformation from applied force. Elasticity, I think I did a bad job by putting these in order. <laughs> so, you know, but I know I, on the other slides, I, uh, I mixed them up. Anyway, definitions, I don't have to really define too much for you. Everything is set in there. You know, it's just definitions that you have. One of these definitions, when we talk about dental materials, uh, we will say it has a, you know, more hardness than the other one or more elasticity than the other one. So we need to know what we mean by these words. Okay, the next slide is the same thing also. So we have the other definitions here. Uh, hopefully I did uh, change these things. The amount of dimension change, a dimensional change it can withstand without breaking. Ductility. <laughs> yes. I guess I did the, the same bad job I did there. <laughs> Blank is the ability to compress uh, to be compressed and formed into a thin sheet without rupture. Malleability. Blank is the ability to absorb energy without fracture. Toughness. And blank is the amount of energy material can absorb without uh, permanent deformation. And that is resilience. Again, uh, I think they're all clear. There is. Clarified, let me know. Uh, further clarify, let me know. Okay. When we uh, start thinking about the types of restorative materials, and when we say restorative, that means the materials we use to restore something. If a tooth is have a cavity, we restore it. If a tooth is missing, we restore it, right? If a tooth is missing a crown, we restore it. And so we have different types of restorative materials, which we kind of talked about a little bit, but now we're talking about the actual composition of that material. So we have three types. We have metals and we have ceramics and we have polymers. So for example, can you give me an example for a metal uh, restorative material? Gold. Gold, yes, what else? Silver, Silver in what form? Amalgam, exactly, right? Uh, what else that we can use metal? Maybe crowns, right? Crowns and the insides are metal. Uh, implants, huh? Bridges, right? Bridges technically are crowned, glued together in a way, right? How about ceramics? What is a restorative material that is a ceramic material? Veneers, yes. I think someone is uh, moving through the other slides. No? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, veneers, right? And uh, what else? Maybe other crowns? And then polymers are mainly the uh, composite material, so the tooth colored materials, and as well our uh, dentures, for example. They are polymers, right? So anyway, these are the three types of, the three main types of uh, dental materials that we use uh, for restoration. So this is the metal, as we said. So definitely it has strength, ability to conduct electricity and heat, malleability, ductility, and, ductility, and luster. So it's shiny, as we said, it's amalgams, crowns, implants, partial dentures. And here, when we say partial dentures, because some of the partial dentures has the metal portion of it, but it's also have another portion, which is uh, uh, technically uh, polymers, right? And you can see this is, what is that? Implant, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> the implants to crew in a way, but that is our actual dental implant which definitely we're going to talk about more later, but it is metal. So these are an example of the metal types of restorative materials that we have. What is this thing here? No, the middle one is the partial dention. Bridge, that is a bridge, exactly. You can see. It is exactly, it can be more than one tooth. As long as more than one tooth, that is a bridge, right? If it's a one tooth, then it's a crown. If it's more than one tooth, it's a bridge. I mean, we're going to go further with this, but the main difference between a bridge and a crown is that a bridge, other than it's three, but it's, it replaces a missing tooth. 
a bridge replaced a missing tooth, a crown is just a cover of an existing tooth, right? So for example, this bridge would, uh, you know, replace a missing tooth while sitting on other existing teeth. Anyway, let's move on for ceramics as we said. The crown just covers an existing tooth, covers the crown part of an existing tooth. So the tooth is not lost. It's just destroyed in a way that we cannot just build it up by a filling. So we have to build a crown on top of it, which is a cap to hold it on and uh, to, uh, you know, to make it more, you know, back functional. While a bridge is a missing tooth that we want to replace. Okay. We're definitely going to talk more about them, but that's a general view. Ceramics is the other type of the dental restorative materials. And as we said, for example, we have crowns that are ceramic and we have veneers that are ceramic as well. And this example, you can see these are the crowns here. And this might be even a bridge that is all ceramic. And we have these, which are what? The veneers. These are the veneers. You see how they look like a... A fake nail, right? <laughs> and that's what the veneers are. So technically, the veneers, uh, if if we want to differentiate them between, you know, from crowns, a veneer is just a layer that covers mainly the labial or the buccal side of the tooth, right? While a crown covers the whole crown of the tooth. It's just aesthetic, just for the shape. You know, uh, I'm sure you've heard about Hollywood smile, maybe. You know how people, how actors, how famous people change their teeth, a lot of times it's veneers. So they just drill their teeth a little bit on the front and put these um, shell-like teeth, right? And then put them in there and that will make their teeth look nicer and all of that and more square and all. <clears throat> no, they definitely glue them on. Then bond them, yeah, they have to etch the teeth. Sometimes they have to prepare it a little bit, but yeah, definitely uh, it has to be glued on, yeah. So these are veneers and these are crowns and as we said you know crowns can be metal crowns can be ceramics so it can be any type of um, it can be different types of materials and then polymers which th is the third type of the uh, the third type of the um, um, you know restorative materials that we have and mainly uh, polymers will be the denture bases right so these are complete dentures and these are the denture bases which are uh, polymers and uh, the teeth as well, so the denture bases and teeth. And as you can see here, composites, which are our main filling material, the tooth colored material, they're a mix of polymers and ceramics, okay? Composites is the main filling material that we use in offices that are the tooth colored material, you know, the white material, or the, again, the tooth colored one, we call them composites and they are technically polymers. So uh, to recap, we have three types of uh, Restorative materials, metals, ceramics, and polymers. We know that metals can be crowns and bridges, implants, some of the parts of the partial denture. For ceramics, we have crowns and veneers. And for polymers, it can be the denture bases. Uh, it can be uh, also part of the composites. Okay. When we're talking about reactions in dentistry, again, we have definitely also a physical reaction and a chemical reaction. Let's move on. And then the type of um, how the reaction would actually set. So it can be a chemical set, it can be a light uh, activated and it can be dual. So what do we mean by this? So if you see here in this picture, we're mixing something, right? We're mixing a powder and a liquid. And when we mix these, or, or even sometimes, you know, you have these super glues where you have two types of material you have to mix together. And what will happen after you mix them together? Sets, right? They will set. So this is a chemical reaction. You didn't apply light to it to be activated. You did not apply anything else. You just mix two materials together and it's set. So that is one type, which is the chemical set. Technically, you're mixing two materials and it will be set together. Other types, you know, in dentistry, because when we make a, a, ca a filling, we want to shave it and make it look like the tooth, right? So the doctor have to kind of work their way out and, and shave it and form the cusps and the grooves and all of that. So we need some time to work with this, with our material. 
So what we came up in, in dentistry, we came up with materials that will be light activated. So only when we're done shaving it and putting it the way that we want, we will apply to it and it will cure. So that is the second type of cure, which is the, the light activated cure. And technically these are the lights that we usually do uh, use in dentistry. Maybe some of you have fillings and you've seen them, you know, shining that specific light, which is an, you know, an ultraviolet color that will have the material to set. Okay, so that is another type of reaction. And then we have also, we invented materials that are dual set. So we can cure them by lights and we can cure them by just chemically, you know. So you mix them, they will cure by themselves. But if you want to actually cure them faster, you can use the light to cure them together. But they call them dual set um, materials. Okay, again, a lot of other definitions because we're going to use these words more. So. Blank time, and if you can see here this picture, we have a mixing time on the bottom here, right? And we have working time, and we have initial setting. So the initial setting time means the mixing time plus the working time, right? So those of you that have been in our lab and mixed plaster with us, uh, our mixing time per plaster was what? One minute, right? About one minute. The mixing time to be able to mix the water and the powder together before you start using it. That is the mixing time, right? The working time is the time that we can use it to pour the model before it starts to set. And then the initial set is when setting, you know, that is the first set before reaching the high, uh, the full strength. So if we want to see these definitions, let's see. Blank time is the time to bring the components material into a homogeneous mix. Mixing, right? That is the mixing time. Blank time is the time permitted to place and manipulate the material in, a, in the mouth. Working time, exactly, right? That is the time that we work with the material. And blank time, that is the initial set that begins when the material no longer can be manipulated in the mouth. And then we have a final set time that is when the material have reached the ultimate state which is the ultimate strength. Technically for plaster, it would be about 24 hours. Oh, it says density and utility. Oh, I don't know. Yours too, guys? Well, you guys are on the iPad, so I cannot deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know, maybe because the, the other slide is uh, jumping for these on these. Now, exactly, so much. That's why, I, as I was telling you, if you use the Word, you know, docu the Microsoft Word, that would be the best viewing experience. That would be the the, the right way to do it. Um, but I mean, you have the definitions there, so you should know these. Um, and then definitely you'll have the recording what I want to do is maybe to share the full version on my side, you know, with you just to make sure that you guys have the complete correct answers for everything. Maybe before the exam, once we're done with all the lectures, I can share with you the, you know, the original PowerPoints with all of the fill in the blanks filled out. But again, uh, you have the recording, so you can always go back and, and, and see it. So manipulation, uh, this sums it up. I think. Read the instructions, right? <laughs> Read the instructions. You know how to manipulate the, the materials. So when I ask you for, for example, you know, how long we would mix, oh, how long, uh, yeah, yeah, how long we would mix the plaster, we can just read the instructions on it or the impression material. You will get to know our materials that we have in the lab and what time required, how many powder and how much liquid you're going to put you know, to mix them correctly. But when you go out there in the office, you have to go and read, you know, just get the, the thing and see what it says in it, what is the right way to mix it, how long you need to mix it, how much powder you put, how much liquid you put, and that's it. That's that. just like you make a cake, right? You have a cake mix, you read the instructions, you know, they have to preheat the oven, you have to put the milk first and then the powder and then, you know, these things. So just read the instructions and definitely you'll be able to, uh, to have a great mix and have a good uh, manipulation. So you'll know the ratio of the components, how much how much liquid to how much powder in it. Um, 
you'll know, uh, do you want to mix it quick or slow? Uh, and mixing it on a pad or paper or glass, you know, we have different types of areas that we mix it on. Definitely, if you sometimes, generally, if you mix faster, you'll have uh, a set or over mixing will have the setting time quicker, you know, your material would set quicker. Higher temperatures usually will accelerate the reaction as well. Uh, lower ones will reduce that. So again, when we were working in the lab doing the plaster, we told you to get the water from the tap because the tap water is the cool water. If you get a little bit hotter water, you'll not have enough time uh, to work with your material. So your working time would be uh, less. Any questions about what we talked about? All good, right? It's just common things that you need to know um, about dental materials. So handling and safety. Guess where our profession as dental assistant lies in uh, out of the most dangerous uh, occupations in the United States? Five, right? And that's why I have the next slide. You have, uh, it's time to run. Because <laughs> our occupation is actually, it is dangerous because we are exposed to diseases and infections, right? We have all the things that will can cause diseases, saliva and blood and sharp instruments, right? <laughs> Everything that you need to make, uh, you know, to get infected. And not just that, also, we have radiation, <laughs> right? So that's another another source of, of danger. And then definitely, that which they kind of also, I think, didn't mention here, um, it's the, you know, the long hours of standing. You, know, you stand for a long time. You are, you know, hinged back for a long time. So having back problems is an issue in the dental field, right? If you do not really think about it actively, about making sure that you're sitting correctly, you're stretching, you know, each day, uh, you'll start having back problems afterwards. So that's a problem. So our profession is actually dangerous. And that's why we have to learn how to uh, properly protect ourselves and protect our patients definitely uh, to be able to to survive in this, um, or to enjoy also not, I don't want to survive. <laughs> yeah, run. <laughs> so, so anyway, I got this from an article from Business Insider. I did link to it, so you can actually click the link and read it. But yeah, I mean, again, when you look at these things, uh, you'll, you'll know that our profession is, is dangerous and uh, they don't give us tips. So <laughs> I always say, you know, we have to have a hashtag tips for dental assistance. You know, you tip everyone that, you know, you, you work with this, your servers and uh, everyone else, you know. So I think us as dental assistants, we do tons of work and it's, you know, customer service at the end of the day. We floss, we clean, we mop the floors and all of that. So I think they should put a tip jar <laughs> in the front office. So if, the, you know, person likes you, they can just give you some. But other than tip, I mean, I, I think generally our salaries should be much more than it, it, it is. I mean, it's good uh, to start with. It's not bad, definitely, but I think it should be higher. Again, assistance, we do a lot of work. The office really depends on us. Uh, we do front and back. Uh, we mix. We take impressions. We take x-rays. We're exposed to all kinds of different things. Again, these, these dangers that we're exposed to... Uh, you know, they cost at the end of the day, right? So I think I think the there should be a minimum wage for dental assistants. Like they should set some kind of minimum wage for for that type of profession. Anyway, uh, but yeah, hopefully you're still uh, you're still going to continue with us <laughs> and be a dental assistant. It, it is a rewarding job. Again, definitely, it's a great. Uh, experience you know if you find the right office you'll love every minute uh, of it and definitely you'll you know go through some offices until you find your perfect match where you feel appreciated you'll get your benefits and it's a it's a great career definitely so uh when we are thinking about the um general handling and safety so definitely uh, all of the chemicals can cause harm if we do not handle them properly. And we have a lot of chemicals in our dental office. So some of these hazard uh, that we have. So 
we have technically five types of hazards. So we have particular matter. So technically these are the things that can, you know, be in the air, such as the plaster that we mix, the alginate. These are powders that it can get into our uh, respiratory system. We can breathe them. They can cause problems for us. Mercury, which is in, um, in what do you call that thing? Amalgam, right? Although nowadays there are offices that would not use any amalgam, they're called them, you know, they call themselves mercury free. Uh, but again, it's a hazard. If you do not use it correctly, uh, you can get a mercury spill, you can get into your tissues and all of that. Uh, other toxic effects of chemicals that we use, airborne uh, contaminants and biological contaminants. Again, all of these are things uh, that are hazardous in our job environment, and we're going to talk about some of them uh, here. So if we think about how the chemicals would be entering our body, it can be through technically five different routes. So inhalation, which we meaning, you know, we inhale them, right? Ingestion, which means that we have them through the eating or drinking, you know, they can be on our foods or our, on our fluids or water or, you know, whatever drinks that we're having, we can have them in there. It can be absorbed through the skin, right? Uh, it can be direct contact as well. And it can be with a needle. So it can be with injection. So all these routes are the routes of, you know, how chemicals can get into the body or definitely even any, almost any contaminant can get into the body. It can be through your respiratory system. It can be through the skin. It can be through a break in the skin and it can be through um, the eyes. So that's why we wear PPE and most probably you should know, right? What PPE stand for? Personal protective equipments. That that is what PPE means, right? So, uh, give us some examples of the PPE that we have. Gloves. Okay, what else? Huh? Goggles. Masks. Huh? Uh, lab coats. Right. A face shield. Right. All of these. So we have a lot of PPE, all of these things here fall under our PPE. So goggles, as you can see, this guy wearing goggles, a mask or a respirator, a gown or coats, gloves, definitely, leather shoes, right? So that will not have um, sharp instrument puncture and slip resistant. That'll be even better, but... Um, so that we don't have any punctures through our shoes, any liquids would not go through. Face shields, which is sometimes, you know, above the goggles just to protect our all face. Hair nets also have been added uh, in some offices, especially with COVID. Because again, you can get things on your hair and you touch your hair and it'd be on your hands. And, and even shoe covers, you know, especially when we do surgeries like, uh, A lot of oral work, uh, you'll wear almost all of that, you know, even the shoe cover just to make sure that no contaminant will be in the, uh, in the room, the surgical room. All of these are parts of our um, personal protective equipments. We're good, right? Okay. So again, this is the other type of contaminants that we, we might get, the particular matter. So again, we talked about some chemicals there. This is the particular matter, and that's what I was saying. So the materials that have some particles or dust, such as, again, the... Uh, I think I have this. 
like the plaster that we mixed. Hopefully, you know, thankfully we didn't get any of these incidents when we were mixing um, plaster. But yeah, <laughs> mixing gypsum for the first time. You'll find a lot of these memes uh, going on. So yeah, we have a lot of these things when we manipulate them, such as gypsum, alginates, uh, microblasting, uh, some materials like they're doing here, uh, and pumice. So all of these have small particles or dust that can uh, get into the air and then can get into our respiratory system. So definitely we have to always wear our PPE, our masks, when working with these uh, things, so to keep ourselves healthy. Again, remember, we're going to work with these materials for a long time, maybe for the rest of our lives. So if we didn't start taking care of ourselves now and taking the prior, uh, the correct uh, uh, protection, uh, we might, you know, it might get to us by the end of our career. So um, what we want to have also exhaust uh, ventilation. So we do have that actually in the, in the lab. Uh, we have some exhaust fans that will take the chemicals, uh, vapors sometimes out. So most of the lab areas and offices should have an exhaust fan or ventilation so that the air would not, you know, will start to uh, circulate. So you want to have that or some kind of suction when you're doing trimming or grinding of the materials. So we have a disease that is pneumoconosis um, and that is technically uh, what would happen to our lung if we are exposed with chronic, which means a lot of exposure, uh, to the dust that is generated when we work with dental materials. So these are, you know, pictures of a healthy lung and of a diseased lung. So now we're talking about the biological contaminants. The other ones were just particular, so they're not biological. These biological ones can include microorganisms, infectious diseases, and these, you know, they can find them in our saliva, the blood, the body fluid, and oral and respiratory secretions. And again, as we said, we're really close to the patient. We work with all kinds of these things. We're in touch with the saliva, with the blood, uh, with the bodily fluid. Um, so we are exposed to all of that. So we definitely, we have to protect ourselves by adhering to the requirements by OSHA, which stands for Occupation, Safety, and Health Administration, right? And also the infection control guidelines by the CDC, which stands for Centers for Disease Control. The main diseases that we can contract where they are the most dangerous for us are definitely hepatitis B uh, virus, HPV, or hepatitis C virus, and definitely HIV through uh, a, a puncture uh, injury. That's the other type of contaminants, so the airborne or the bioaerosols, and um, definitely these are, the means it's a cloud-like mist, which we have, this is our, what do we call this thing? <laughs> Not it. <laughs> the handpiece, right? The high-speed handpiece. So this is the device that we definitely we use to drill the teeth with. Um, jumped down, and it has the water with it, and that is to cool down the uh, the tooth, so we do not burn it as we cut it. So we have a lot of this water, and this water would make a a mist like uh, vapor, and definitely would be a cloud around us, and uh, we can get inhaled that, and then we get the diseases. The other device that you see here is called a cavitron or an ultrasonic scaler. And that is what the hygiene use, what the hygienists use. And again, dentists also can use it. So uh, we'll be again exposed to that. So this is the device that they use to break down hard calculus that are on the teeth. Uh, and again, we use water to clean up and reduce the heat when we work. So. Any of these can contain bacteria, viruses, molds, fungi, and yeast. All of these can be included in that water vapor that we have. And even some particles of the human teeth, oral fluid, and all of that, lubricating oil, abrasives, and uh, abrasive powders. 
So again, these are all things that we can get exposed to. And definitely the best thing to do is to wear our PPE and follow the right uh, instructions for infection control. So for these aerosols, we have technically two types. We have ones that are larger than 50 microns, which would actually not stay in the air and they would land on the eyes or the skin, right, and the PPE. And we have a smaller one and they would not go further uh, as, you know, than three feet. And we have the smaller ones that would actually remain in the air for hours even. You know, when we're talking again about these aerosols that we have, so we have a bigger ones and a smaller ones. So what do you think the bigger ones are? Flatter, and then the smaller ones are the aerosols, right? So again, these are two types. Some of them are heavier, bigger than others. It will land on our skin or PPE, and that's why we want to clean our surfaces, and that's why we put the the protective covers on our the instruments that we use and the the things that we touch to, you know, make sure that we trash them after we use with the patient. But we have also the aerosols that will remain in the air uh, for hours. And I think what COVID is, I think COVID is heavier than that, right? It would not remain. I don't remember now, but I think the COVID virus, I think it's, I think it's one of these ones that will stay a little bit in the room. That's why they advise not to uh, go back to the room after you work with a patient for 10 minutes to get that to settle down in a way. Anyway. Oh, yes, thank you. It should be smaller. Yeah, so aerosols are the smaller than aerosols, yeah. So aerosols would be smaller than 50 microns. Okay. So how do you think we can reduce these uh, aerosol risks? What is our, well, other than definitely, you know, taking care of everything, you know, infection control with that, but what do we use in the office? Well, that is our, for protection, yes, exactly. But what else we can use to reduce these? What is this thing here that they're using? Most probably you guys don't know it yet, but HVE, right? The groups that have been in the lab know it now, which is the high volume evacuation, which we call HVE, high volume suction or high volume evacuation, HVE. So this would suck all that air, uh, and I mean all that mist and water, uh, and that will help to protect us in a way to reduce these aerosols. And then also what we can do as a protective matter is to give the patient some mouth rinse before the treatment. So even if we get some of these aerosols, at least their mouth is now kind of more clean because of the mouthwash, we disinfected their mouth. So it's always a great, uh, a great step to do when you get your patient in before you start working with them you want to do, uh, you want to give them mouthwash and explain that it's not because, you know, they smell bad or anything, but it's just to, as a way to disinfect their mouth a little bit before we start working, All right? Some people will smell bad and you want to give that to them anyway, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. And um, reduction, do, do, do by also some coronal polishing, brushing and flossing again. So if they brush or floss their teeth before we start working again, this would reduce that as well. Nowadays also with, with COVID, especially when this was before, you know, already we have some machines that are extra machines, you know, not like the HVE inside of the mouth. We have some uh, vacuum machines that are outside of the mouth 
that will take all of that extra aerosols that we couldn't get with our HVE. So, uh, but with COVID, it, it happened even more and more. It, you know, they start, people start using it. So you'll see, you know, next to the patient head to, to suck out all of that, these particles. And these are just a before and after use pictures of some device that is out there that you might see in offices. Okay, we know chemicals are bad. Uh, chemicals can catch fire, can react to or expose or explode, I'm sorry, can be corrosive. So chemicals are bad. You have to know how to use them and how to work with them. Each material that we have in the office should have an SDS. And SDS stands for safety data sheet. So the government, I think, uh, have... Uh, made a rule that each type of material that is done should have a documentation of how, uh, what are the dangerous chemicals that are in it and how to you, how would you uh, handle it? And what do you do if you, if it got in your eyes or in your skin and all of that, that information for each material is, is in the CD, uh, SDS file, right? So each one of these materials that we use, even the plaster, the alginate, all of that have a CDS document that we can download from the, uh, or request from the manufacturer of these things, of these materials. And each dental office should have an SDS sheets book, either, you know, physical one or on a computer. If you see in our lab, we do have a, an SDS book that is by the door where the phone is, you know, when you, when you enter and it has all of the things, you know, for each uh, material that we use in the office or in the lab, uh, we have a documentation for it. Okay. So each dental office should have the CD, uh, the SDS, the safety data sheet for the material they use. It can be in a physical form, which is like a book printed, or it can be retrieved in a, an electronic form. Okay. So see, it will, Contain the information about the chemicals, the hazard, the handling, the cleanup, the special PPE related to the product and all of that. So it's a great tool for us to know how to work with that. Another chemical that we can get exposed to is the bisphenol A, which is the, PB, the BPA. And I'm sure you've seen these before, you know, on the water bottles, it says BPA free, right? Uh, so it is a chemical that is used in, in the polymers in a way uh, and used in making plaster in general, uh, plastic, I'm sorry, not plastic, plastic in general. So it's in a lot of our uh, drinking bottles, any type of plastic. So then, you know, they discovered or some people say that it causes problems. So see some studies show that it can cause uh, an increased diagnosis of diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular diseases, and liver abnormalities. So that's why now some companies, or when you know purchase, especially the water bottles, uh, they would say it's like that is plastic. They will say it's a BPA free. Uh, so in the dental office, we have that in our composites, the materials that have the BPA that we use, sealants and composites. So we get exposed to it because we work with these materials. So that's another, uh, you know, exposure that we might get as well. You see that the FDA have uh, not yet said that it's a health concern, but again, exposure to mercury. Again, we're just going through these things that we can get exposed to. So there is definitely a known health risk. Um, so you have these precautions have these precautions that you want to take when you work with mercury. So in a well-ventilated area, these are the amalgam capsules. These things that you see, we're definitely going to work with. You can see when you open it up, which you should not, because we mix it up before we open it. Uh, it has a powder and it has mercury in it that will get mixed up. Uh, but these are called the amalgam capsules. Uh, that's why I put the pictures here. Anyway, you want to work in a well-ventilated area. You don't want to have any direct skin contact. You don't want to inhale, uh, to inhale mercury vapor and so on. Store in an unbreakable tight seal containers away from heat. When you prepare it, use preloaded capsules, which are these. Uh, reassemble the capsules immediately after you take them out. 
and then clean spills with the specific instrument that we have. Again, amalgam restorations are going away. You might not have one done in your office for a week, you know, or for a month before you see any uh, one of amalgam restorations done. Again, because the composite restorations that we have now are getting much better. Uh, so that's why we're kind of this danger is, is going away. That risk is going away. We have a lot of also chemical toxicity. Generally, we have two terms. We have the acute and we have the chronic. The acute, you have a, a high level exposure over short time. So acute is short time. And then chronic is for longer time. You keep exposed for them in smaller doses. And that is technically like what happens with x-ray, although we're talking about chemicals here. But any chronic exposure means that, you know, you get low doses every time, but for a longer time. So if you expose x-ray every day, and then again, you're not taking your precautions, you'll be exposed to radiation a little bit by a little bit by a little bit, and that will cause a chronic exposure. And same thing with the chemicals as well. So these are the chemical protection, uh, personal chemical protection sets, similar to the PPE that we talked about, but some of them are a little bit more hard, like the vinyl and latex love would not provide adequate protection for chemicals. So you want to have a chemical resistant glove, such as nitrile gloves that are chemical resistant. So they are more recommended when you work with chemicals. You want to have eye protection that is most probably a side shield. So like a complete eye protection, not just the goggles. Um, you want to have a protective clothing that is rubber right that is uh would pro you know protect you from any spills when you're working with chemicals and also a respirator uh rather than a regular mask so with chemicals you want to be a little bit more uh safe definitely than just regular ppe we have usually uh a kit and we do have that in the office in the lab uh which is like a mercury spill kit that you can uh, used to clean the mercury spill if you if we spill some mercury in the office so they are specific things that we can use uh, and even for flammable fluids for acids uh, we should have an eye wash station which we do have and definitely we have ventilation this is an eye wash station um, our eye wash station is just like something that you pull and I must probably you've seen it at the sinks did we show that to you guys I think we told you that we have an eye wash station on each sink on the other side, the ones that don't have the traps. But definitely want to have that, again, uh, to control the chemical spills and to control these kind of things. Uh, this is just for you to look at. It's not, you know, something that I'm going to ask you about. Uh, so see how long you want to, eye wa to, you know, wash your eyes if you get exposed. So, for example, chemicals, you want five minutes. Uh, Non-irritant or mild irritant, you want, I'm sorry. <laughs> That is the five minutes. <laughs> and then the moderate, that is, anyway, again, this is just for you to kind of look at. So even, you know, there are some corrosive, you have to wash your eyes for half an hour. And then the other ones, you have to wash your eyes for an hour. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this picture before COVID um, happened, and you can see they're wearing respirators, right? Not regular masks. They're wearing hair nets and they are fully covered and they have this hose thing that is in there. The patient's completely covered. This is not because of COVID, this is because of the amalgam removal. So if a patient have amalgam cavity in their teeth, which you'll see some of them, especially older people that have amalgam fillings in their teeth and you know the amalgam start to deteriorate, and another cavity happening and we need to remove the, the amalgam. Most offices, you'll see they would never do this. <laughs> they just remove it, you know, sometimes without even having a rubber dam on the patient. But technically, this is the safest way, the safest way to do it because, again, of the amalgam of the uh, mercury vapors. So amalgam by itself, if you mix it, put it inside a patient mouth, will be safe because it's set and it's done. But when you try to take it out, you have to use the high-speed handpiece. This will create heat and this can... <coughs> Uh, liberate some of the mercury vapors out and again with all of that water going on these can go in the air and can get into our system 
So the best way to do it is to make sure that you're completely covered, you're wearing respirators, not regular masks, and you have that uh, vacuum to suck all of the extra particles to protect you and to protect your patients. Storage and disposable, uh, disposal of chemicals. So uh, definitely you have to look at the expiration dates and that's when you want to, you know, uh, not to use some of these materials if they're expired. Uh, when you have an empty container, you don't want to use uh, for anything else than its original purpose. For example, you know, you have a container for a disinfectant and then it's empty. You cannot use it for distilled water, for example, right? So you, you don't want to mix up these things together. Okay. So classified as hazardous weight. So when you are trying to class, so right, we have all of these bins uh, in offices and they say biohazard, right? So you will classify it as hazard if they are one of these four. So blank is flammable or combustible, ignitable, right? So it will be ignitable hazard if it's flammable or combustible. Blank if it's highly acidic or basic. Reactive or corrosive? Corrosive. Unstable or explosive? Dr. Nima, no. <laughs> Reactive. And then toxic is the... So these are what we classify uh, or the types of hazard classification and what they mean. So if it's ignitable hazard, that means it's flammable. If it's corrosive, that means it's acidic. If it's reactive and so on and so forth. Now let's see how many of you are going to get this. So take a look at these. Think what do you, what, which each one of them would be. Again, I have these for you and I'm sure I didn't put these in order. Um, so just try to think uh, or to pick which one is which, and then we're going to go do this all together. What each one of these signs, these are the hazard signs that we have um, in, in most, you know, in offices that we might have in our dental offices. Uh, so we need to know what they would mean. Okay, let's see. So the first one is, huh? Corrosive, exactly. So like an acid, right? What we said corrosive is highly acidic or basic. The second one, flammable, right? Fire. Third one, toxic, right? That one, Reactive or oxidizer or a fireball. <laughs> this one you should know. Radioactive, right, or radiation. That's what we have on our door, even in the lab, on the lab door. This one, biohazard has already have that. And this one is laser in use. Because nowadays, you know, we have laser in, uh, in offices. So, if you're in a room where you're using laser, you have to put that on outside of the room of the of the treatment, you know, so that no one comes in the room without knowing, you know, without wearing the correct eyewear uh, uh, goggles because there are specific goggles for laser when you work with them. Nowadays, again, offices use laser for 
uh, surgeries, for um, uh, periodontal cleaning sometimes, and periodontal work, gum cutting. So again, if you're using that, you should have a sign in the office and you put it on the room that you're working in so that would not, nobody would enter without um, knowing that. I think we're almost there. So laboratory infection control, Technically, it's similar procedures as we do in the dental office, but something to think about. You know, you take an impression for the patient, and then you pour the model, and you send it to the lab, right? So if we did not take good care of disinfecting the patient mouth in the first place, and then disinfecting the impression that we took, and then we poured the model with the plaster, you can see that they found that some microbes were live in dental casts up to seven days of pouring them. So even after seven days after we pour the model and it's set and we send it to the lab, the lab people get, get infected of that model that we send them, for example, or they send us maybe, right? Because the lab will send us as well, just because of the powder, right? But what they do is um, in these powders that we mix, they actually put also antimicrobial uh, components to help with the infection control. But again, this is something to think about. So effective communication is good. So if anything is infected, you might want to put that. It's not clean or anything like that. Make sure that you have the standard precautions and appropriate PPE. For each uh, office, we should have a, a, a hazard and OSHA communication standard in a way. So you have to have a written communication program where you say, this person is going to be responsible for this thing, right? Uh, you want to have a chemical inventory, which means that you have to list all the products used in the office that contain chemicals. Um, you have to have safety data sheets, as we said, labeling of chemicals containers. So you have to make sure if you have any new container, you have to have a label on it um, and label exemptions. Uh, and these are the ones that here, the fire, the, nation, the National Fire Protection Association, association use, you know, if you're using specific ones of these, um, you have to have that label on it. You don't have to memorize this. This is just an example to see. But you need to know that this thing means the National Fire Protection Association label. Definitely, you have to be trained by your employer. So we have to make sure that we're training our employees when they're newly hired or when new chemical product is added to the office, how to use it, and once a year for continuing employees. Just again, to make sure that they know, uh, you know how to handle biohazard and hazards. Uh, and again, it's part of our hazard communication program. eco consigned screen practices. So, you know, now we're trying to go green with everything and eco-friendly. There are do's and don'ts. Um, for example, these are the do's and don'ts. You can read them. So, for example, here, don't use paper. Instead, use, instead of plastic uh, surface barriers because paper would allow penetration of money and so on and so forth. So, you can read this if you want. This is, again, just uh, for you to go through if you want to. Uh, choose cost-effective greener options, and there are the ADA top 10 initiatives, which you can see here. Uh, again, you can read this just to be more uh, thoughtful about the things. You know, we have a lot of waste in dentistry, actually. We use a lot of disposables, right? Everything is disposable. The tips that we use, you know, the, the covers that we use. We have, we use tons of plastic, you know, things. So, uh, it, it is, again, they're trying to be more eco-friendly with, with our work. Um, we talked about our safety in our, on our side. The patient's safety is something else that also we need to take care of. So one of the main things that we give to the patient is eye protection. How many of you that went to the dentist gave you goggles? Well, that's good. 
Most of the time they would not. <laughs> they would forget that part, but they should give you goggles, definitely. No matter what type of job they're doing, they need to give you goggles and they need to give you definitely ones that are clean. Uh, especially with COVID now, I'm sure they're giving goggles and everything, but this is a standard procedure. Whenever a patient comes in and we do work on them, we want to cover their eyes because again, we don't want anything to get into their eyes. It can be shaded if we're using, uh, you know, cure, light cure to cure composite, we have to give them the shaded ones. And then uh, to protect the patient airway, we use the HVE, which is the high volume evacuation. So they would not get that, you know, water that we're drowning them with. And the rubber dam, which is this thing. Uh, we're definitely, you know, we're going to use that rubber dam, but it's, it's just a plastic material, as you can see, or rubbery material that will protect the patient mouth and just keep the teeth that we're working on out. Uh, so in that way, any contaminants, any chemicals, anything that we work with will not be inside the patient mouth. So it's a great way to protect the patient and definitely a great way for us to have a better isolation because one of the most successful uh, points of, uh, of a successful uh, filling or work is to have moisture control. So you don't want any saliva to get on the teeth and uh, on our work. But anyway, this is also a great way to protect the patient airway. And then definitely instrument handling. You don't want to, you know, drop things on the patient or, uh, you know, puncture them with, with sharp instrument. So again, as we take care of ourselves, definitely we have to take care of our patient's safety. And that's all. Any questions, concerns? So let me stop the recording here. We don't go further.